And a very warm welcome to this fireside chat series called Navigating Changes. My name's Julia Streets, and today we're talking about the future of custody. We're thinking about how data and technology are transforming conversations with clients. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by two guests. First guest is Caroline Butler. She is BNY Mellon's Global Head of Custody, Tax and Network Management. The second guest is Ryan Cuthbertson. He's the Head of Product Management for the Standard Chartered Bank Security Services. So welcome both. Delighted to have you both here. Now, Ryan, I'm going to come to you first of all, if I may. Now, you've been talking a lot to clients and one of the things you've particularly noted is that that whole dynamic between the bank and the client seems to be shifting away from being a simple service provider to being much more of a strategic partner. And I'd like to get your thoughts on what are those high level industry challenges that your customers are facing? Yeah, th thank you very much, Julia, and, and absolute pleasure to be having the conversation with, with you and, and Caroline. So I would say a couple of things. And firstly, with the right partners align, the traditional and legacy way of viewing intermediaries and, and their role in delivering services to asset owners and asset managers has changed. There is an incredible opportunity to remake the security services industry and enhance the client experience. Yes, absolutely enabled by new and more effective technology and ultimately custody and security services has been and will always be a people game. The ability to build relationships to articulate and solve problems jointly in a pragmatic yet future looking way is paramount and quite rare. You know, skills for today are different than yesterday and skills for tomorrow are going to be different than today. So working with partners to deeply understand their requirements and understanding when to pivot workforce to deliver change is, is key. I would also say your know, ideating and delivering innovation requires a crystal clear understanding of client needs, be it services, be it new asset classes such as digital assets. You know, having the building blocks in place to be agile in approach is a core requirement. You know, and finally, I would say that there is a lazy narrative in the industry at the moment that talks about custody being commoditized. If you really believe that, my firm view is that you should be thinking about doing something else. There's so much left to do. And there are transformational opportunities, both in terms of efficiencies and client experience, in particular, as we move further into digital assets and digitization space. Well, Ryan, I think that frames uh, the conversation beautifully as a starting point. Caroline, let me come to you. I'd love to hear your thoughts and your responses to, to Ryan's remarks. And also, you know, thinking about perhaps one of the challenges that you've been particularly looking at. Yeah, thanks, Julia. And, and obviously, um, I was sort of laughing at Ryan's remarks on the uh, commoditization of custody. We have a phrase here at Bank New York, which is making custody cool. Um, and I do really feel passionate that custody has become quite a, a cool area to work in. You know, if you think about this pivotal time in our industry, innovation and custody are, are going hand in hand in every conversation we're having. So it's no longer just about scale, safety, stability, all super important and still core tenants, but it really is about all things digital. Probably informed a lot about the world we live in. It's a digital world. Our clients live in the same world as us, so they are citizens of the digital era. So the client expectation to Ryan's point is really driving that digital experience and that partnership that you start to see with clients, with providers, and then across that whole ecosystem. And it really is helping custodians sit at that epicenter of change and that epicenter of innovation. I would argue we're ripe for that. Um, I think, you know, the time is now. Arguably, it was probably a couple of years ago, but there was definitely a little bit of apathy on the custody side to really jump in and transform and innovate. And again, I think the backdrop of fee pressures, the digital world we're living in was really pushing us into that, which is what makes it exciting to be running a custody business. I mean, Ryan and I have talked about this quite a lot, but you know, it really is bringing, bringing innovation to the forefront. And with that, it does change the nature of the people that are in the custody business as well. Ryan said it, it's a people business. And the end of the day, you use technology to really free up and empower people to do what they do best. And we're really starting to see a real see change in the types of people that are coming into the custody business. I mean, just speaking for my own team, we've 
we've hired mostly from either fintechs, crypto firms, um, or traditional tech firms of late. And now we're working on the infusion of core SMEs in the business over the decades with this new talent and trying to harness the best of both and really infuse and cultivate that talent together, which I see both as the biggest opportunity in our business and also one of the biggest challenges because fintech firms have operated at quite a different pace, banks in particular, given the regulation that is put on us. So I think it'll be quite interesting to see again, the infusion of, of the different diverse talents in the custody space. And it is a fascinating dynamic shift when you think about it in, in, in that way. And, and can I just ask you a further question, which is when you were working with Standard Charter Bank, there was a moment in time when you thought, oh, actually, we're looking at some of the challenges. You talked a bit about fee pressure. You've talked about the role of technology and then also talent as well. When you thought of the bank, was that an aha moment or has that been something that over time you've been thinking, look, I think there are more and more areas where the bank can help. I'd love to hear your perspective about the relationship. When you take a step back and you look at, you know, providing asset servicing and custody as an implicit part of that, you start to realize, and I think a lot of banks have come to this realization, that you can't do everything yourself. You can't be the expert in all things all the time across all markets and across the diversity um, of the markets and the diversity of asset classes that our clients invest in. So it really is about picking the best of partners, whether it is fintech partners, whether it is more traditional partners to access the markets in the best way. And I'm not just talking about pipes and plumbing, because again, the base stakes is to be able to bring a digital experience to our clients and to have digital integration across that ecosystem. But it also is to bring the client servicing aspect. So again, digitization just frees us up to add a better client service to our clients. And really for us, leveraging that as an extension out to our clients, that's what we look to do holistically with our sub-custody network to make sure that, again, the digital experience is there. We see that as a 101, but really looking at an integrated service offering where we can really bring the best of client service out to our clients. And a really key part of that digitization conversation, data and analytics always comes up in conversation. I'd love to, if I may, to just ask you some questions around data and analytics. And is that something you've looked at across the board or have you been focused in very specific areas? Because we all recognize that it has great potential for unlocking opportunity. So I kind of look at data in two different ways. One is as a custodian, we sit on a powerful amount of data and it's the ability to give clients access to that data in an easy way, in an expedient way, and in a way that actually translates insights to them so that they can make better decision making. So again, I think where years ago, this could have been a differentiator. I think now the role of a custodian is to do that. I think the other side of data for me has a different use. Driving all of our processes through a data-centric model enables us to actually connect services across the ecosystem better. So I think before the you know, more legacy framework was point-to-point -point connections, or it was a little bit process-to-process, -process, um, arguably a tiny bit clunky along that chain, if you like. But now with all of us starting to think through how do you bring a data-centric um, operating model to play, it enables that, again, interoperability across the full ecosystem, so not just services that are offered within our own banks, but obviously services that are offered across our banks um, and or across different players um, in that ecosystem. So it enables us to actually connect the services for a client in a much more seamless way um, and in a much more meaningful way. To me, it comes back to client service in the end of the day. If we're able to give the right level of insights, the right forward projection to our clients. We're elevating our value to a client in a way that isn't just telling them what happened. It's enabling them to predict what may happen, given all of the trending that we've seen. So at Bank New York, and I know at SCB, we work on a lot of things like predictive analytics, whether it's for settlement fails or whether it's for cash availability. And I think those are imperative to the role of a custodian is to really look at being able to harness that information you have to drive a different level of client service in the future. And Ryan, you were talking about the power of the relationship and how that shifted, you know, from being service providers to being strategic par partner, if you like. I'd love to hear your thoughts on, you know, the role that you've played in helping Caroline achieve those ambitions. So I think it comes firstly from, from wanting to do it. 
there are people that want to do things and want to make a difference and, and want to be true partners and want to help business grow. And there are people that don't. So, so, so the starting point for me is always, you know, having a desire to, to do something, do something together and, and have a crack at you know, changing the ecosystem for the better. Um, Caroline's absolutely right with, with her comments around data. We refer to it as solving the intermediation lag. Our job is to make sure that Caroline and importantly Caroline's clients get the very, very best level of service that they can through the many intermediaries that, that sit between uh, an investor and, and an issuer. And so thinking about things slightly differently, we, we believe that we've been able to elevate that proposition, make Caroline's job a little bit easier, hopefully along the way, but ultimately give her clients a far better level of, of service, which makes that business sticky, which makes them feel like they're closer to and connected to the markets. And you know, the advocacy part is, and Caroline mentioned it before, is also incredibly important. So you think particularly around the standard chartered footprint where we're operating in uh, frontier and emerging Far East markets and where the investors are predominantly sitting in the Western hemisphere, that's a challenge for them. They don't understand a lot of the time what's going on in Bangladesh or Sri Lanka or, or Oman or, or Zimbabwe. And so us being able to provide the right information at the right time through new methods of, of data transportation is something that we believe is at the center of elevating that client proposition. And one of the topics we've talked about has been common opportunities, unlocking opportunities, and also thinking about the advantages to the end client. I wonder if we could just broaden it out a little bit more and think about the industry as a whole. And, and Ryan, I know last year you were holding a number of different think tanks, thinking about you know the benefits for the whole of the industry. Love to hear some thoughts around some of the areas that emerge from those discussions. We have an opportunity to do something on more than a bilateral basis where there's willing players or willing actors within the ecosystem to do so. Five years ago, even maybe three years ago, we probably didn't understand technology enough as it pertains or as it applies itself to security services to make those leaps. There's still a trust issue, right? So if we're talking about having a single golden source of, of data, a distributed ledger is probably the most sensible place to start with that. Ultimately, someone needs to own that, right? And that somebody needs to have the trust of the other actors in the ecosystem to be able to push and pull information off it. Um, because they're going to be basing their books and records, their actions, their interactions with their clients off the back of what that single source of data data says. So, so that opportunity is there. We will do it bilaterally. You know, when the opportunity comes to ex extend that to a multilateral conversation, then we're, we're more than happy to do so. We, we have a pretty clear vision in our mind of, of what that looks like. And we're waiting for the right opportunity to, to test that out. When you look ahead, what do you see as the greatest opportunities for the industry and, and, and its potential to collaborate as well? Uh, Ryan, can I come to you first? You can. Um, so I think the greatest opportunity is, is to start again, right? So me personally, I've been in the industry for almost 25 years now, right? and, and I'm starting to think about things from a white piece of paper. So forgetting the legacy conversations, data conversations that we used to have with clients, forgetting around you know, east to west and are taking days to move collateral from, from one clearinghouse to another. You know, we really do have the opportunity with the ability to tokenize assets, to use natively digital assets when central bank digital currency or even commercial bank digital currency is accepted amongst financial institutions, we absolutely have the ability to, to remodel the entire ecosystem. It's incredibly exciting. And we're, we're re really happy to be having meaningful conversations with, with our partners on how we achieve that together. Exactly, as you say, there is, is a really, really fantastic time with great potential ahead. Caroline, I'd love to ask you the same question. As you look to the, down the road ahead, where do you see the greatest opportunities for all? Yeah, I, I echo Ryan's passion on our opportunity to do things differently now. I mean, one of the reasons why I'm so excited about digital assets and I'm not just talking cryptocurrency, but the wider digital asset um, pool, whether it's tokenizing traditional or bringing new markets to life, is the fact that we have the opportunity to do it differently. We actually have to do it differently. It demands a 24 by 7 type operating model, which 
the legacy way of doing custody does not easily permit. And it really gives us that opportunity to step back because in the end of the day, what is absolutely imperative is not only that we can offer the full breadth of services that clients need as they diversify, whether it's geographically or into different asset classes, but it's the ability to connect across the different ecosystems. So as we you know, storm ahead and start building out a whole architecture for digital assets that arguably is more modern and futuristic, you still have a traditional world that you have to navigate as well. So I think building the bridge between those two worlds that, you know, I I personally don't see the traditional space evaporate in, in a heartbeat. So I think the ability to be able to offer services across is really important. And that's very challenging, right? If you think about it, it is very easy to to start up a new company and offer from scratch. But the ability to do that, plus connect into the traditional world, and again, bridge between those two, um, it is very challenging, but it's an absolute need to do. I think there has been a pace of change in the custody world over the years that's kind of steady. Um, now I think that pace has to accelerate akin to the pace that you would see in the, you know, more fintech environment. Um, and we've got to be ready and willing to, to move fast and be agile to whatever comes next, because a lot of what we're doing, particularly in the digital asset space, it's, it's uncharted waters. So, you know, the, the, the rules of the game, if you like, change quite a lot. Um, so being able to build products and services um, and operating models to support them that are agile and nimble to whatever those changes will come is absolutely imperative as well. Um, and I think that's a, that's a cultural change for, for custodians. These are fascinating times indeed. I can't tell you, I've really enjoyed this conversation. One of our fireside chats called Navigating Changes, Caroline Butler, BNY Mellon, thank you for being with us. Ryan Cuthbertson from Standard Charter Bank, thank you for all your thoughts. I hope you've enjoyed the conversation as much as I have. I've been Julia Streets. Thank you for watching.